May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As some of you may well be aware, my life and ministry have been very much shaped by my formative experiences in Iran, and in particular the profound injustices that we experienced both as a family and as a church community following the impact of the Islamic Revolution of 1979. It's as a result of those injustices that as a young teenager I found myself here in England where I've remained ever since. It might not surprise you to know then that I've spent much time pondering the well-known verse from today's Gospel reading and what it means to say, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. I could preach this morning on the nature of the relationship between the Christian person and the state. At a time when rhetoric about migration and refugees continues to be divisive, and amidst disagreements about commitments to carbon net zero, the approach to the national housing crisis and many other issues, there's much that could be said about what it means to live in a harmonious relationship as citizens and when it might be appropriate to make protests. But let's explore the meaning of the encounter that Jesus has in today's Gospel story. Clearly, a trap has been set for him. Jesus is confronted not only by the religiously rigorous Pharisees, but also by the Herodians, a group supportive of the Emperor Herod who wanted a peaceful coexistence with the Roman occupiers. And the question is brilliant. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the Emperor or not? It's a brilliant question because no matter what answer Jesus gives, he'll be the subject of suspicion. If he says yes, he'll be derided by the Jews for acknowledging the authority of the occupation. But should he say no and declare himself against paying tax, then he marks himself out as a revolutionary. Either way, with the crowd hemming in, he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Jesus's answer demonstrates his skillful avoidance of a trap so obviously laid for him. It's also a perfect example of the way in which Jesus could get beneath the surface of a controversy to the heart of the issue and what was really at stake. And that, I think, is important for us. You see, it would be easy to spend inordinate amounts of time reflecting on the circumstances in which it's lawful to withhold consent from government policy that's pursued on our behalf. Indeed, that's an honourable question which has taxed many a theologian, for example, and perhaps especially in relation to what conditions are necessary for a war to be just. But I want not to go down that road because it seems to me that that would be an easy trap for me or for us to fall into. So what does Jesus do in response to the question that's put to him? Let me see the coin that you carry, he says to them. It's all too easy to forget just how scandalous this next part of the encounter is. For the Pharisees, it was abhorrent even to touch this coin that bore the graven image of the Roman oppressor who even claimed to be God. But Jesus, taking the coin, addresses not the presenting controversy, but the essence of the underlying issue. This image of Caesar may well remind you of what is being asked of you by the civil authorities, Jesus seems to suggest, but I ask you a larger question. If the image of Caesar on a coin gives him some claim on your money, what then do you need to render to God? The saying, render unto God the things that are God's, has become so familiar to us that we can forget to ask the question, what is the connection between the image of Caesar and giving God what we owe him? The answer lies in the image. It is the image of Caesar on the coin that gives him claim on the money collected through taxes. So where do we find God's image? 
And what claim might that have on us? Well, from the very beginnings of creation, there's been this overriding idea for Jews and Christians, and indeed for Muslims, that human beings are made in the image of God. We are those who bear God's image in our very selves, and so we need to render unto him the things that are his, namely ourselves. We who bear God's image are to render unto God our whole selves, all of what we are. And this of course has implications for how we live and how we relate to others, for they too bear the image of God. And that's where it can get tough. It's one thing for me to accept that I bear God's image and should give my whole self to God. It's quite another thing to accept that someone else who I might dislike or disagree with, or who is simply utterly different from me, that they too bear God's image and can render unto God everything that they are. So with this intriguing passage from the Gospel of Matthew, we are, it seems to me, at the heart of a Christian approach to humanity. You are who you are because God made you and forms you and loves you. And this forming of you is no accident, for in your very self, through the essence of who you are, you bear the image of God's very self. Now for me to respect that, and for my life to be guided by it, I must both acknowledge that I'm known and loved and made in God's image, but I must also honour those who are different to me, for they too are known and loved and made in God's image. In loving, honouring and serving one another, we demonstrate that we are all bearers of God's image and that we are called individually and collectively as a church to render our whole selves to the glory of God, to be used and shaped by him. Render then unto the civil authorities what is their due for they can never touch those deeper things of belief. Those belong only to God. Amen.